All right, welcome to this episode of Photo Theology. I'm your host, Doug, and today what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at two economy line SLRs. It's going to be the Canon 6D versus the Nikon D600. Okay, um, now for just to have good measure here, we're also going to introduce, <coughs> sorry, uh, the Nikon D7100 and the Pentex K5 II. Now, the reasoning for introducing the Nikon D7100 into this test is that at this point in time in the digital SLR world, uh, there's a new trend going on with the 24 megapixel sensor and what we want to do is we want to stack the 24 megapixel sensor of a compact sensor-based SLR versus a full-frame based SLR. Uh, for those of you who are wondering what makes a full-frame a full-frame, basically it's just physical size. There are some other things I'll get into a little bit later, but it's the physical size of the sensor, which is 35 millimeters. A compact sensor typically is about 23 millimeters. Okay, in, you know, in size um, of the physical sensor that's going to be there. But the reason why the Pentex, the K5 II is there is because it uses the traditional 16 megapixel compact sensor that we have seen now for a number of years in the SLR arena. So the Nikon is using a Toshiba first generation 24 megapixel sensor specifically designed for Nikon cameras at this point in time at least. And the Pentex is using a traditional Sony 16 megapixel sensor um, that is, you know, designed for multiple cameras. But anyways, you guys get my point. Okay, in the running up here, we are going to be looking at the Canon 6D, like I stated, and the Nikon D600. Uh, both of these cameras are full frame based cameras. These cameras are both economy line cameras. Now, economy line just means that they're cheap, or they're as cheap as they get. Uh, they both clock in roughly at about two grand, depending on how you buy them. You might even be able to get them cheaper than that if we're talking body only. And this new lineup of camera that is a economy line SLR is made to address an issue that Nikon and Canon are both facing. Um, if you have seen a lot of my other reviews, then you already understand that Nikon and Canon, when it comes to a compact based SLR sensor setup, kind of, well, just doesn't do that great. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, the first reason is this, is that Nikon and Canon build SLRs that range anywhere from 5,000 to you know, thousands upon thousands of dollars. And when you build that kind of lineup of camera, you've got to justify to the consumer why they are spending the money that they're spending on the product that they're spending the money on within the lineup of what the manufacturer offers. That's just reality. And the greater your selection, the greater you have to emphasize on the product, its performance, and all of the above. Now, this can be impacted in the way of mechanics of a camera. This can be impacted in the way of image quality uh, when it comes to a camera. It can be impacted in the form of the marketing that the camera is given and a whole slew of other things. Uh, but usually it will fall in one of those main three categories, uh, or it could be a combination of the three or two of the three, so on and so forth. But what Nikon and Canon have both done is they both looked at the market and they have both now come to the conclusion that the only way they are going to keep the traditional SLR lineup vibrant and alive is through the concept of full frame. Now, there is a good reason for this. Um, for those of you who know about compact SLRs, Basically, the SLRs that are the size of a point-and-shoot camera, and you can attach, you know, a, you know, a different lens to it. Those cameras, 
are now starting to take a large chunk of the traditional sales that Nikon and Canon have gotten in the past. So understand from a pure, you know, who holds market share, compact SLRs each year pretty much grow and grow and grow and grow in terms of sales. And this is posing a threat to Nikon and Canon's dominance in the world of digital SLRs. Now Nikon has tried to offset this with their Nikon 1 series, which is totally bombed in, in every, you know, given respect. I mean, it, it just hasn't worked out for them whatsoever. Um, they're, they're taking another shot at it. It's still not going to be going anywhere. Uh, compact SLRs at this point in time are just not Nikon's thing. Canon also has tried a number of different strategies in the compact SLR arena. And none of them have, you know, taken flight for them either. So both manufacturers are basically looking at the writing on the wall. And what they're trying to do is say, okay, you know what? Going small is not going to go over well for us at this point in time. So why don't we just go bigger? And that's the idea here. It's all about going bigger. Everybody else wants to go smaller, then let's just go the opposite direction and go bigger. And that's why you have these economy line, you know, SLRs. The other thing about the full frame economy line SLR is that it is made to address another issue, which is sensor type. So at this point in time, you have cameras that are now, you know, crunching out 24 megapixels and they're under a thousand dollar price point. Now, if that is the case for the Nikon and Canon full frame arena, that is a big issue that they have to also face as well. Because some people don't pick necessarily the size of the camera, some people pick the size of the megapixel. But behind every great megapixel count, you have to have a strong sensor. And it is generally believed that a bigger sensor is a better sensor for a higher megapixel count. <clears throat> now here on Photo Theology, we have completely disproved this uh, time and time again. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, but, you know, some people tend to believe that. Uh, the truth is, the bigger the sensor, the lesser the megapixels, the better your image is going to be. Uh, provided all the other technologies are current day, that's normally how that works out. But I'll digress. All right. So, why full frame? Why is it relevant? You know, why do people care? Let me start off by saying this. Um, the test that you're going to be looking at is going to be set up in two sections. You are going to have the Corel section, which is processed by me, and then you are going to have an Adobe section that is actually processed by DP Review. And what the Adobe section is for, because it's done in Adobe Raw, is a cross-referencing. All right. Basically, what you're going to be looking at in these tests is the sensor's integrity, okay, or basically the cross-platform capability of the camera sensor. So one of the things that makes a great camera a great camera in general is the fact that you can go from one editing platform to another and you keep your image integrity. That is like the most important thing when you talk about a digital camera. This is one of the toughest things for people to swallow because a lot of people tend to believe that a camera is a great camera just because A, their friend said so, B, because it's been marketed well, or C, because they're the ones who spent money on it and they just don't want to acknowledge the fact that maybe their camera's not so great. That's normally how it works. But in the real world of cameras, what makes a camera a great camera, A, is how you are able to sync up with it in terms of your shooting style and what have you not. B, it can fulfill those needs that you have when it comes to the concepts of your composition and all of the like. And C, how well it does when it comes to a cross-platform perspective in terms of editing. 
going from one software package to another, to another, so on and so forth. The reason why this is important is this. If you are photographing, let's say, a variety of pictures under, you know, whatever conditions they're under, all right, generically speaking here, you look at it on the camera and you think, man, these are some great shots. I can't wait to get these things home, um, you know, edit my raw, and then pop them up online or make a big giant print or do whatever I'm going to do. Okay, that's what you're thinking. You looked at them on the camera. They look really awesome. Now what you're going to do is you're going to, you know, export them into your photo editing program, batch convert them, do whatever you're going to do, and bam, there you go. But what ends up happening is once when you get home, you stick it into the photo editing program and the RAW ends up rewriting, or I'm sorry, is rewritten by the photo editing program. That's what happens. So it looks one way on the camera, but it looks completely different in the RAW program. And you're trying to figure out, well, why is this? Why is it when I'm taking pictures, it shows one thing on the camera when I look at the review screen but it shows something else entirely different in the photo editing program. And that goes back to that whole, well, I don't remember it looking like this, which everybody runs into that. Okay. The way I do my test is this. Um, I input everything into Corel, number one. Uh, number two, I rebalance the image. What this means is Corel takes the core architecture that the camera uses to create its image based off of the sensor and the imaging processor and averages out all of the values so that you get the proper dynamic range, the proper colors, the proper tones, the proper saturations, the proper white balance that the manufacturer has pre-set up within their firmware of the camera. This is why I use Corel and this is why I use their balancing. Then what I do is I export it to a TIFF file. After I export it to a TIFF file, I then export it to a JPEG. And then the rest, as you see, is history. That's what you're watching in the video. That's how I do my um, editing uh, process. Now, when I export it to a JPEG, you're going to notice uh, that although the Pentex is 16 megapixels, it's the same size as everything else here. And all the Canon is, is lesser megapixels than the 24. It's still the same size as everything else here. The reason why everything looks 24 megapixels is because after I export it to a JPEG file, I actually interpolate it. So everything has, you know, even dimensions or the dimensions are more evened out so that it's easier for you guys to view. So when you look at this test, the thing to keep in mind is that when I compare a full frame system versus a compact system in terms of sensor size, the megapixel count is within a, a very, very fair margin of error. In other words, I'm stressing the megapixel count of the Pentex K5 II in this setup. Okay, so now on to the concept of full frame. Why is it people care about full frame? Uh, what is this great concept behind it? Let's get into that. Okay, now, uh, before I get into that, I do want to say this. I am going to be talking about the Nikon D600 and the Canon 6D, but I want to talk about the history of full frame first because that is what pretty much drives the sales of full frame models. Okay, so to begin with, a 35 millimeter sensor is supposed to be equivalent to a 35 millimeter film setup. That's the first thing that we have to acknowledge here, okay? So when people make that switch from, you know, film photography to digital photography, if you want to have a purist switch, okay, then from a sensor standpoint, you got to go 35 millimeters. That's what's actually believed. The reasoning for this is it deals with your colors, saturations, it also deals with your level of dynamic range, it deals with your ISO control, it deals with your depth of field, and it also deals with basically your ability to project the proper image size in terms of cropping, megapixel count, uh, the whole nine yards, how that stuff all works out. Okay. 
that's, that's why the 35 millimeter sensor is actually valued. Now, there is a mythology around the 35 millimeter sensor because for some reason in the camera world, people believe that it has to be just like the analog world when you're talking about digital to analog. In other words, to be pure, to keep everything exact, it has to mimic exactly what the old, you know, setup type was. Only in the camera world is it believed that if you go digital, if you go smaller, it is worse than if you would have stayed the same size. If you talk about cell phones, for example, versus like old rotary phones, your cell phone now is what? Like the size of your hand, literally, could even be smaller than the size of your hand. It can do so much more than like an old rotary phone. Those things were like huge, big and bulky. But in the camera world, it is believed that the bigger you stay, the better off you are. This is going to address here in a moment, or I'm going to address, uh, the myth behind full frame. And let us start off with the most recognized full frame camera that's pretty much ever been produced. Or pretty much was, you know, afford affordable in the sense of, you know, people being able to, you know, go out and buy it. Which was the uh, Canon, the 5D. Uh, Canon 5D came out in, you know, 2005. It clocked in body only at 3300 bucks. This was the first real, you could say, full frame camera that was out there on the market that most people resonated with. I'm not saying that there weren't other cameras, I'm just saying that this is the one that most people resonated with. And this camera actually did a lot to actually drive full frame. Uh, the truth is, its legacy far outlived the production of the camera. And there are still people who want to buy a Canon 5D today. Uh, this is the first full, or not the first, but it is a, you know, a full frame unit, uh, 35 millimeter sensor. Uh, and at the time that this camera came out, it was considered to be, you know, the top in its class. Of course, there weren't very many cameras to begin with in terms of a Canon lineup. But it was considered to be, uh, except for, I want to say, the 1D setup, uh, the top in its class. And for a number of years, that's the way it was uh, portrayed. Now, like I said, colors, saturation, dynamic range, ISO control, megapixels, those were all big things. In reality, compact sensors have always been able to match certain aspects of full frame or even take them, uh, or, or even overtake them, I'm sorry, or even overtake them. Uh, you have, for example, in 2006, basically the introduction of the live MOS system by Olympus and Panasonic, which used a four-third sensor, basically 16 millimeters. It projected full-frame color, full-frame saturation. Also, it had the same level of ISO control, depending on what model you talked about. And basically, it was like the third of the price. What it lacked was overall dynamic range. Now, in 2000, around, I want to say 2008, Pentex came out with their K20D. This used a compact sensor setup, 23 millimeter, and it was able to overtake the 5D in terms of megapixels, in terms of ISO control, utterly crushed it in ISO control, dynamic range, colors, saturation, and it even had an auto white balance adjuster, which the Canon 5D, you know, didn't have at that point in time. Now, granted, you're talking roughly, I want to say, in the neighborhood of about, for the sake of the conversation, let's say three years later for the, uh, the Pentex to come out with something that would utterly defeat the Canon. But since that time, since the time of the K20D, there has always been this back and forth between whether full frame is true or whether it's just hype. Now, on the higher end of things, it is true that full frame is everything that they claim it is. 
because you're spending like five to you know seven thousand dollars on a camera and you know it ought to be what it is uh, that just makes perfect sense but when you talk about the uh, concepts of an economy line full frame system things work a little differently now one thing I do want to point out uh, that is undeniable between a full frame system in a compact sensor system for an SLR is this. It is crop multiplier versus depth of field. If you want a camera that is going to give you a longer reach in terms of zoom, then you have to go with a non full frame system. The reason for that is the camera actually works off of a multiplier at that point. So in other words, if we're talking about an Olympus or a Panasonic, they use a multiplier too. So if you put a 100 millimeter lens on there, you get a 200 millimeter focal length. That's what you get. Where if you have like a, you know, 5D Mark III, you put a 100 millimeter lens there, you're going to get 100 millimeters. That's how that works. Uh, 23 base millimeter sensors normally have about a 1.5. So if you put a, you know, 100 millimeter lens on a, you know, Pentex or a Nikon or whatever that's non full frame, uh, then what will happen is you're going to get 150 millimeters. That's basically how that works. Uh, now, that works to the advantage of the crop sensor if you're talking about macro and stuff like that. However, if you're wanting to have a shallow depth of field, in other words, you want to have depth of field control and true depth of field control um, beyond, you know, what you would currently have with your compact sensor type, then what you have to do is you have to go to a full frame. That's the only way to achieve maximum depth of field control at this point in time. However, there is this thing called a boost adapter that is now coming out for cameras. And basically what the boost adapter does is it actually eats away at that multiplier for compact sensors which means that you actually get a true you know, depth of field setup. In all fairness to that though, what I am gonna point out is that if it's coming out for a compact sensor, chances are it's also gonna end up coming out for a full frame sensor as well. So, you know, like I said, full frames are better when it comes to, to depth of field. If you're talking about zoom based aspects, then that completely goes over to a compact sensor, all right? That's the one thing between the two that cannot be denied. Okay, so let's get to the uh, Nikon, the uh, D600, and the Canon, the 16. Um, the first thing is this, is that you've been looking at the, uh, the images now for a while, okay? Um, and you have noticed that there's quite a bit of difference in terms of what the Nikon has been producing and what the Canon 6D has been producing in terms of actual image quality. And there's a reason for this. The thing you have to keep in mind is that both of these cameras are economy line full frame systems. There are two ways in which you can look at an economy line full frame system. One is basing it off of image quality, which is what the Nikon does. The other one is basing it off of the mechanics and features which is what Canon does. So, to begin here, uh, the Canon 6D is going to have 11 autofocusing points and it can autofocus at a minus three exposure. The Nikon, on the flip side, is gonna have 39 autofocusing points, but it can only autofocus at a minus one exposure. This means that if you're shooting in lower lit situations, the Canon 6D is the way to go versus the Nikon D600 from an autofocusing perspective. Hands down, Canon 6D all the way versus Nikon D600. The only thing you have to be careful about with the Canon 6D, um, which Canon does tend to have this problem, because the Canon 6D does work more off of a Rebel architecture than a true full frame architecture, is that if you're dealing with a very shallow saturation contrast situation. The camera is going to have a hard time locking on to more, we'll say, solid colors that are intended to be locked on to. 
in order to capture the subject. Because of the slight variance between you know, color A and color B in this stuff blending together. That's going to be the first thing. Um, the second thing is when we talk about ISO control, all right, the Canon 6D is going to clock in at between 50 to 100,000. That's your range. The Nikons is 50 to 25,000. Now, the Canon's numbers look very impressive, and they are very impressive. Okay, 50 to 100,000 is pretty good versus 50 to, you know, 25,000. And I'm rounding the numbers here just to let you guys know. You guys can always look at the numbers yourselves if you want hardcore numbers there. Um, but the Nikon has better ISO control. That's what Nikon goes after here. So it's all about the quality of the ISO control versus the range of ISO. And that's one of the major differences that you have between the two cameras. Now, main things that are going to set the Canon apart from the Nikon is the fact that it's going to have GPS, Wi-Fi, and cell phone app capability. Okay, I'm not really going to get too much into that stuff because honestly, I don't think that stuff matters that much at this point in time in the world of cameras. Um, quite frankly, if you want to have Wi-Fi, GPS, and cell phone app capabilities, then go buy yourself a Samsung, okay, that has those things. All right? I mean, that's, that's what I would say at this point in time. Go buy yourself, a, go buy yourself a, a camera that has an Android system to it, and then you can, you know, do whatever you want to do there. Um, when it comes to actual, you know, image quality, and when it comes to the mechanical functionality of what the 6D is going to provide. Being able to geotag your images doesn't mean much. Wi-Fi capability in terms of transfer, fine, whatever. And cell phone app capability, sure, there could be some advantages there, but I can promise you, you're not going to be editing, you know, like 100 raw images inside your cell phone at this point in time. So that's more gimmick based than anything else. If we're gonna look at it from, I wanna say, a real SLR perspective and not some like, oh man, guess what? I'm into the latest and greatest in terms of gadgets and look at what my camera can do kind of deal. Uh, the Nikon is gonna have a completely different perspective on it, which is it doesn't have all those robust features, but what it does have what I'm about to go into is a lot more going for it. The first thing is this, the Nikon is going to be a cross platform sensor. This is really important to understand because the Nikon D600 is their first camera in their lineup that is a cross platform sensor. Listen, we've done a lot of reviews on Nikons. Nikons have gotten a lot of low scores. I'm quite sure you guys can remember what happened when the Nikon D7100 went up against the Pentax K52S and it got utterly destroyed. And there are people that still curse that review today because they believe that their Nikon is the great bread and butter of the universe. And it's been proven that the 7100 is just not that great. You can also remember when the Nikon D7100 went up against the Nikon D7000. And if you looked at the core architecture, it was superior in terms of noise control and resolution. But the moment it was dumped into Adobe, which is what you guys should be looking at now in my review, the moment it was dumped into Adobe, because there was such a massive restructuring of the architecture of how the image is actually outputted, because that's what Adobe does. Adobe completely restructures everything. Um, it lost all of its advantages in terms of noise control and clarity and ended up being equal to and less than in the end of the Nikon D7000. Here you have the same kind of problem with the Canon 6D versus the Nikon D600. The Canon 6D's biggest issue is that it is not a cross-platform sensor, number one. Number two, its second biggest issue is the fact that it relies heavily on the concept of Adobe. Colors are oversaturated. Things are over contrasted. You also have a dynamic range that has a ton of potential. But the problem is, is that that potential is eaten up by the headroom that is taken away just so that Adobe can rewrite the image 
and make the image look presentable in the way that it originally should have been or closer to the way it actually should be. When you talk about the colors and the tones, those things are just completely offset. They really don't match up. Even in Adobe, if you compare it to the Nikon, it doesn't match up well at all. But more importantly, go ahead and compare it to a Fuji, which has even better color. Or go ahead and compare it to a Pentex, which once again has better color. If you're talking about cross sensor platform capability, the reason why I have the Pentex K52 in this setup is that it is one of the most reliable base sensor slash imaging processor setups that you have out on the market right now. The Nikon D600 is being compared to that. Now, Nikon's approach here is very simple. They are emphasizing on the image quality of the camera. That's what they're doing. And they're doing an excellent job in relationship to what this really means. The reason why this is really important is this. The whole idea behind having a full frame camera is this. A full frame camera is supposed to be, be able to give you the image output that allows for a user to be able to change from one editing platform to another, whether it be multi-layered based editing to film simulation to whatever crazy idea that the, you know, photographer slash editor is trying to implement. The full frame is supposed to give you that grounding, that arc, that, that foundation based on the architecture of how the camera is built so that you can achieve those things and you keep maximum efficiency when you go to output the image. Because of the nature of how the Canon is built, and the truth is it resembles more of a rebel in nature than anything else. It's just a rebel with a 35 millimeter sensor in it. This is one of the downfalls that you're now going to actually see in the full frame arena. Meaning that manufacturers will now start producing full frames and they'll say, well, you know what? it's not all about necessarily the image quality. Because if you want the image quality from Canon's perspective, that's what a Mark III is for. You spend that extra, you know, thousand dollars plus to get it from that. You definitely don't go run to a $2,000 full frame unit and get it from them. And that's just the way they feel about it. Where Nikon, on the other hand, their thinking behind this is once when you go full frame with us, we want to keep you forever. And the best way to actually keep you is to keep that image. So if you actually look at a Nikon D600 and then you look at a Nikon D4, the image is very, very similar. In fact, it is extremely similar. In fact, it's almost the same. And in some cases, I prefer the Nikon D600 over the D4. And you're talking $2,000 versus, you know, a whopping $6,000. Now, here's another thing that you have to keep in mind. If you're going to go full frame, you also have to look at lens selection. Here's the thing that you always have to think about when you're going full frame. Is the lens selection there to utilize the full frame capability? If we're talking about the Nikon, the D600, or the Canon 6D, what's really important to know is that you are basically going to tack on, for the sake of the conversation, let's say another 500 to a grand getting a lens for one of these cameras that's going to make these cameras work the way you want them to. And if you're lucky, you're going to be using an F4 setup in terms of the F-stop. For that kind of money, I can purchase 
the Pentex K52 get their 16 to 50 one point I'm sorry not one point but 2.8 millimeter lens and I've already got you beat it's over it's done I have a 16 wide 15 standard 2.8 ultrasonic motor I'm able to shoot at a minus three exposure my autofocusing speed will clock in at a you know or actually lower than a point a point one versus the Nikons which is going to be a point two six with a premier lens and the Canons which is a point two nine with a premier lens I mean these are the kind of things that you have to think about when you're selecting your camera is full frame offers a lot of potential if you are willing to make that investment but if you're looking at the kind of investment you're making what else can you get out of another brand that is going to be able to you know sway that difference the other key is how you actually are able to manipulate your pictures edit them in order to get the output you want are you dealing with a proper cross sensor platform or are you dealing with something that is predicated solely to a certain software setup and it really can't go beyond the bounds of that for this review if we're talking full frame I'm going to give it to the Nikon D600 normally I wouldn't do that but in this case I've got to so you guys take care and I'll talk to you later alright bye bye